Hello and welcome to another episode to Straight Outta Stanton. As you can see, it's a little bit different one. We have a guest, Ed, with us. Uh, we did mention that we are we are brewing something different. To be fair, uh, it's it's kind of a drought with with star season content, anyways, with with the devs being on vacay and end of the year and the start of the new year. Also, we're not really expecting a lot of things to happen, anyways. Uh, but yeah, it's it's me and Maso as usual, and we have a bunch of questions for Ed, who I'm I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about yourself and why we have you here in the first place. Hi guys, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I'm Ed Douglas. I'm a uh, game dev. I make movies. I make video games. Um, been making games on and off um, since about 2005. Um, mostly in the storytelling side, but also in production and design. So some of the big games I worked on, Mass Effect 2. I was in the was a senior designer on that in cinematics and storytelling. I've done a bunch of Need for Speed games, um, a lot of cinematics, some writing, some story, and uh, worked at a handful of other studios, doing all sorts of things um, there with Ubisoft on Rainbow Six and some other Tom Clancy stuff. Um, little bit with Sony on a Little Big Planet spin-off. And for a little while, I had my own uh, game studio called Flying Helmet Games. We made a little um, RPG called Eon Alter, which was uh, um, uh, which was its own weird, wild adventure. It's kind of kind of indie game that reviewed very, very well and sold very, very little, which is a <laughs> pretty, pretty darn common thing. Thank you. And uh, on that one, I was I was uh, in production, I was in design, I was in narrative, I was on the biz dev side. So, yeah, whole, I got to help a little bit with that one. That was really fun. <laughs> I was just about to say, if I'm not wrong, yeah. Masa was part of that project as well, slightly. Well, a little bit. Mm. I don't know. I just hung out with them a bunch. That's honestly that like where I talk about uh, on our previous episodes, like uh, you know about uh, having a little bit of insight into kind of the process. That's that's where I got to see a lot of it because. You know, again, like that that studio was headed up by some of my some of my good friends, so I got to kind of really see into the guts of things. Yeah, and, you you yeah. got to play some early prototypes when it was. I think you played some when it was a board game, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we we prototyped things as a board game, just trying to hash out some very basic mechanics, and then we built one whole big version of it, which we thought, hey, this is going to be great. And then as soon as we got it all together. Some of it was great. Other parts of it were like, this is never going to work for a, like a real game. And uh, we ended up scrapping most of that and uh, and rebuilding with a very different design ethos. Um, so yeah, that, that actually does kind of lead into one of the one of the talking points that we had here. Uh, one of the things that Chegg and I have never been shy about criticizing with uh, CIG and some of their uh some of their uh decisions is you know is game ideas that that just like they they just don't like it doesn't seem they logical don't sound way. good <laughs> yeah. it doesn't sound fun mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like it's ever gonna work and uh like one of the things that i wrote down on these talking points here was was just about like how common those are in the industry but but i can give you an example things, yeah for example okay, an, and yeah. and I'm not going to take Star Citizen uh, right now because for me, like in a way, Star Citizen is still in development and I'm sure a lot of the ideas are like, you know, thrown around and will be changed and whatnot. I, I, I'm, I'm aware that things need to be tested and, you know, but but here's the thing. We have a we have an MMO that just came out from Amazon, uh, the glorious or inglorious new world. And um I don't know if you're aware. I don't know how much you're you're like actually gaming and if you have time for it and whatnot. But but it's an MMO that was supposed to be PvP only, and and then they figured out that that's not a good idea because majority of player base will you know they they're just literally cutting off probably like seventy percent of their their you know potential player base and which is resources and everything. Um, so a year before the launch, they decided to kind of revamped the, the game and add a lot of pv content into it and um they made some decisions that n immediately did not make sense to a lot of us who play games on a regular basis especially mm -hmm. mmo so that when i played the first beta there and i'm not like some super smart person or whatever it just i take myself as you know just a regular joe player whatever 
but I, I went into beta and I and I literally picked out three, four things that, in my opinion, just cannot work for an MMO. And I can tell you now, three of these are why the game is dying. And they know it. Like, now they're addressing this. It's like the territory wars where one one faction out of three takes all, the entire territory, you know, yeah. all the territories and the whole economies is screwed up because of that and how the entire population of the server turns into green for example because otherwise they they lack half of the gameplay and whatnot and uh, like things like that where, where i guess that the the question is how common is that developers um I, for me it's like do these people even play the game the game type that they are making does it even matter on a project or not? Like, how could mm. I see this and you couldn't? Not you personally, obviously. Mm. This, these are the things that, that are just yeah. uh, very, very strange for me because everyone I was talking to at the time, we were like, well, if they don't change this, oh, they're going to change it because that's not going to work. Other games tried it. It never worked out. There's no reason to try it again. Games died on this very, you know, <laughs> mountain and they did it and died on that very mountain. And I just, I just don't get it. How come, you know, how how come something is like obvious from the outside, yeah, and and still manages to kind of make it through, uh, to to final game sometimes. So there's a whole lot of questions in there, yeah. including yes. how how often are there bad bad design ideas before a game is done? Do do game designers actually as uh, eat their own dog food, as we say in tech development? Sometimes do they actually play these games? Do they? Um, do they? Do By the way, I, what, I did uh... try my dog's snacks, and and people laughed at me on my stream because I told them I gotta know. It's like it's part of my family. What the hell? And and they're not tasty. You guys don't want to try it. Like there's no, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not good. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah. So when when I'm thinking about that, I mean, I I, I want to back up, but. I just want to kind of back up in my own mind and think, okay, creativity. Creativity is is hard. It's really yeah. hard. Ideas are really easy. Everyone has ideas. Making something good out of the idea, that is incredibly hard. So for every for every great movie out there, there is probably a really good idea, a really good pitch. And then you have a first draft script, which is terrible. And it just doesn't work. But that's fine. That's how you start. And you iterate and you iterate and you iterate until the movie script turns into the uh, turns into the vision you had or a version of it, and it evolves over time until something that works on the works on the page. And then you hope it actually works in uh, in the movie when you film it. So when I when I think about game design, yeah, you can have a game design idea that might be that might be trying to achieve a goal and like say hey we want a game that feels like this that that you have this kind of experience and uh, and I want and I don't know what that'll be yet maybe it'll be this maybe this is how we get to it maybe that's how we get to it and and sometimes on paper it just it sounds amazing everything sounds amazing and as soon as yeah. you start making it it kind of all falls apart like wait a minute we didn't think about this we didn't think about that none of this works or the technology is not there or the uh, or the time to do it and polish it just isn't there, and it all kind of falls apart. Sometimes you have an idea that um, you're. So you're asking about how often are there bad ideas? Um, I mean, bad is so 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 subjective. Um, when when uh, mm. when you're okay. playing a, a beta, what? when you're playing or an, an early early version of the game, um, as I guess we get to now, like 15 years ago when I started making games, we never got to do that. Um, no bad idea. We we built things that weren't fun at the time, um, and the only way to see if it would ever get good is to keep hacking at it and saying, "Can this ever match our expectations?" Like we might have an idea in our head. Okay, we think this will be fun. We don't know how to get there. Let's just let's try and see. Um, that and, makes sense to me yeah. a lot. And then yeah. also, I guess one of the things is the player base evolves as well, and the expectations mm -hmm. and whatnot, right? My but the question, like, obviously there's going to be bad ideas. I, I yeah. understand this 100%. Um, and, uh, and I share some of your kind of, well, from a different perspective. Like, I, I worked on movies a lot here in, in Belgrade. 
as well yes. work you know and and i worked with the props team i worked like you know you gotta you gotta create something out of nothing all the time and then it yeah. doesn't work and then but your your the time is tight and whatnot so i understand all that however let's say i'm making a prop and yeah. i do i like i'm gonna sit down at 6 a.m when we have a meetup use my phone to look up what someone else did when they needed to make mm -hmm. this exact prop so that I don't end up falling into the same trap. Mm -hmm. So now when, when you're talking about like, you know, 15 years yeah. ago, that's, that to me is different. Yeah, I, I would 100% expect time, people yeah. to make a bunch of mistakes and learn from so them. How do, we, how do we not, how do, how do we learn from other people's mistakes? Yes. And not make the same mistakes again? Yeah, so that's, uh, so the the Amazon game I've I've heard of it I know it's struggling I don't know the story behind it um, why why are they doing things that people feel like have failed before so I mean they they might be so if people have failed at it before that might mean they see something in it maybe they say mm -hmm. you know what it didn't work before but if we do it this way if we do it that way um, maybe we can make it work this time maybe this mm -hmm. time we can make it work in a way that nobody else has before can they who knows do they don't know until you try to? i guess who yeah. knows who knows you don't know till you try um are they getting are um do they have the the skill and experience to do it like when we when we started eon altar we were making a game that nobody had quite made something like that before and we couldn't just say let's copy this thing from diablo sure. let's grab this thing from halo we had to like kludge it all together and some some people said this will never work and other people said this idea is amazing but i don't know how you're going to pull it off we end up we ended <laughs> okay, up pulling yeah. something off our problem was we didn't know how the heck to sell it and that's where we failed um the early version of eon altar was a very different setup um so i'll i'll tell you a little bit about the game so it's a it's a role playing um, RPG designed to feel like a tabletop RPG. So you watch uh, you watch the game on on a TV screen. It's local co op, but your you use your smartphone as a as a controller. So that's mm. like your your character sheet. It's your controller. It's where you do all your combat. And our special sauce was just like in a, a board game tabletop. You have your own story, your own secrets, things that you can choose to share with your other your friends or keep to yourself. One of my favorite reviews we ever got on on Steam was something like. Um, I looted everything, lost lost all my friends, would play again. And <laughs> yeah. that was like that was just like the perfect amalgam of the type of feeling we wanted to create in that game. And uh, but the earlier version of it had um, we were we when we first started prototyping, we got a lot of interest from some big companies who were really pushing um, pushing a certain kind of device, big big tablet computers, like big lay flat. Um, computers for um, for coffee tables. And the idea you could sit around a coffee table and play this thing. And we're like, that's amazing. That's the best way we could ever play this game. So we designed it a prototype around that. Of course, that market never materialized. It just, yeah, it didn't sure. make any sense. We thought maybe the audience would go that way. We invested like half a million bucks into that version. Oh, this and, was, sorry. This was when didn't go they, anywhere. This was where, um, was it Microsoft was, was marketing that big coffee table touchscreen? That was, that was part around of too, that yeah. era. Yeah, it was part of it too. And we thought maybe it'll all go this way. So <laughs> we had these these big companies really pushing us to go in this direction, sending us tons of gear, giving us all this tech support. And and then on the other side, we had we had this idea of like a super cinematic combat thing um, where on your handset, so on, on the tabletop, it was like this orthographic view and you could see all this uh uh, all, you can see the world and move around it and use your touch, your your fingers to drag your characters around. So a very much this tabletop top amalgam. And then the handsets, you had the cinematic combat on it. But when we finished this demo, like we did this demo, Kotaku did an awesome write-up for us. Um, Apple phoned us up and said, this shit looks awesome. How can we help? But when we really got down to it, that game would have never worked. Um and some people looked at us and said, yeah, no, this will never work. And some people said, this is amazing. Um, but we had to find our own way. And from a business perspective, we knew we needed to do something simpler. We needed to do something cheaper um, because that cinematic combat would never work. We realized that these devices um, would never materialize in the marketplace. Nobody was going to be buying these things. So we we're building a game 
for a platform that didn't exist. Mm. Um, and we changed a ton of our game because we had th these ideas that we were in love with, but it just didn't make sense in the marketplace, even though some people said, this is this is like mind blowing. I love this. Um, this is great. It, this um, is this is so good because we talked about something similar today, actually, before the show, because we are having in Star Citizen currently, we are having an event. Um, it is like timed event. It doesn't matter. It's called Jump Town 2. It's some drug wars, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of strange because I feel like from a player, casual player perspective, the event <laughs> is nothing special. It's It's something, okay? But it's... Yeah. It's nothing special. However, oh, Maso, I think you're muted. Um, I can't hear you, uh, but I can see. No, <laughs> I'll tell you when, when I hear you. Uh, but from the perspective of like of the of the big content creators that are currently playing the game, this event unified them together, and they are having loads of fun. And um, we believe that CIG is the studio behind uh, Star Citizen gets yeah. quite a lot of feedback from from Twitch and YouTube in these mm -hmm. early stages of the game and um and my personal fear for this pr particular event is that they're going to get the feedback that this is an absolute blast and it's amazing when in reality I feel like a lot of player base who does not have you know a voice would probably disagree because you know, it's yeah. it's a really an event that requires a very well organized group in order to do anything, and a lot of people who are not enjoying it, in order for this big group to enjoy, kind of. <laughs> so when I when I hear that, knowing nothing about this, it feels like <laughs> that is a that may be an absolute success for a part of their audience, and that isn't a success for other parts of their audience, and that might be totally okay for them. Uh, for example, I'm so I started playing The Witcher uh, three last year. I haven't played much of it. But I found a huge barrier to entry with the complexity of a, lo a lot of the um, a lot of the crafting systems. And I was looking yeah. at it, it's like I like the story, but there's this massive area. They give me some some pretty rudimentary tutorials, and then I'm left on my own. And I talked to a friend like, "How did you do this?" And he said, "You know what? I, I ignored did. that part of the game. Yeah, I love this part of the game. I didn't go for that part of the game." <laughs> and it may well be that for for CRG, this is something that they know a certain part of their audience is going to love. And certain part of their audience isn't going to love. And what I understand about that game, about Star Citizen, is that it will be so, or it is so huge, that there's something for different types of players. And it doesn't mean that everything has to be for every type of player. And that's absolutely the vision that I've seen a lot of a lot of developers go through. Okay, you I'm don't need to make everything for everybody in a game, especially of that size. I'm going to interject and just confirm that my mic is now working. Yes, it is. Okay. Yep. I will well, take your answer I there. there? <laughs> I saw, like, when I saw your opening mouth, I was like, uh "Oh, <laughs> you wanna, you wanna say it again?" Oh, no, oh, just um, no, no. It's uh, honestly just, just kind of like uh, going back on the the. It was when you were introing Jump Town that, like, I think the other thing that was um, kind of, uh, kind of, I, I guess, frustrating is that. Uh, I think there's a bit of Stockholm syndrome with it too, where like a lot of people seem to think it's this like very fun, super fun mechanic. But but if you compare it to you know to more polished kind of experiences in the industry, it's really nothing that special. Um, so I, I think the danger in kind of or or there's 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 concern in the feedback they're getting from you know from the player base right now because I, again like th there are a lot of people saying this is an amazing experience when in reality it's only really you know it's only amazing, amazing we don't have if anything you're used else. To not if you're yeah. used to not you know like mm. if you're used to a much less uh a polished experience so i um, so knowing game designers as i do game designers play a hell of a lot of games and game designers listen to and read a hell of a lot of feedback from all all parts of the player base. So I would be pretty surprised if they weren't aware of, uh, for this feature, that they they weren't aware of, of hmm. the range of reactions to it. Um, so okay, that's that's uh, fair. Just, that's yeah. this is where I I'm assuming your experience from some bigger studios would come to mm -hmm. play here because I I would guess both. if you're working like Rainbow Six or something like that, you you yeah. you need that feedback, right? You need yeah both. Yeah, both bigger bigger studios and and uh, smaller studios. I mean, there's 
in big studios, there's entire departments there that exactly. are built around player engagement, connecting with players, understanding understanding what people are saying about the games, where the sentiment <laughs> is, um, and and that is that data is brought to um, brought to the developers. Sometimes in like a, like sometimes the developers are like very hands on, engaging with players. Sometimes it's it's at a bit of a distance, but but nobody. It, it takes it takes. Uh, how do I want to say this? Very few people who are making anything quality are going to be are not going to be trying to understand every little bit of what they can of what, uh, mm -hmm. what players are interested in or what they're saying, because that's how they that's how they succeed um, yeah. in, in making a in not just making a great game but making a game that connects with people. Now, th now when I'm thinking about Amazon. Um, that might be a little bit of a different story. And I've worked with some really big studios who I haven't always agreed with how they want to approach things. Um, sometimes there's business goals that are set by folks who aren't who aren't necessarily attached to the game design or game development, but who are attached to other parts of the the, uh, the business of the game. That's the and, part we call marketing they, department, and they, right? And they struggle with they struggle with um, uh, sometimes communicating with the designers. Um, so I have an example. I was on a game a handful of years ago, and we were um, we were coming to the end of the game. Our marketing was ramping up, and we were told um, the marketing department wanted to connect with a uh, with um, a big influencer, or the celebrity, and do some sort of collaboration with mm -hmm. them. Might put them in the game. And when we heard who the guy was, I mean, I, I knew the name. I wasn't that familiar with him. A lot of the folks on the game team says said, hell no. We know about this guy. We know about his his rep. We know about the kind of content he makes. We want nothing to do with this guy in this game. Um, it just makes us feel kind of gross thinking of even being involved with him. From the marketing, so that was the game, a lot of the folks on the game design team. Mm. Um, from the marketing department, they said, their platform is huge probably we hear so... you but their platform is absolutely yeah. enormous and is a strategic way of getting eyes on our product um, which means resources and... basically yeah yeah so so yeah that was uh so that was something that yeah i don't remember how that actually all fell out in the end well, um, that's what i want to ask you like who but... wins usually in these in these clashes because i'm i'm sure well, this in, happens all the time in in every well, in studio that in that clash in that particular clash um i think that the marketing department had had the choice to to listen to the the team or not but it was their choice um and when i say the team it was like most of the people like the lead development team so say the creative director the the lead producer are going to are going to have a pretty deep understanding of the marketing department's needs and their goals and probably would support them. Um, it was like mm. level designers, artists, um, animators, people who are, are creative talented contributors but aren't in creative leadership positions that um, that were pretty upset about this stuff. Um, so yeah, that was that was an interesting um, interesting one to watch. Um, I believe the marketing department won out um, there. I mean, it, it was their choice. It was their responsibility. The marketing department will rarely tell the designers how to make their game. Um, and the designers generally have no influence over how a game is marketed, even to the point where they have the marketing department often chooses the name of a game um, because they know what they can sell. Yeah, of course, hmm. that makes sense. See, this is this is kind of this brings uh, heads in kind of an interesting direction, because um, obviously in the case of Star Citizen, like Star Citizen is uh crowdfunded insofar mm -hmm. as like you know their budget is directly dependent on on sales of well 100 percent like, and, and attracting those, well, those, how, those how is budgets, right how is that different than any other video game except you guys paid for the game before it was done uh I, there's a I couple ways in it's much diff it's much more different yeah. because the game yeah. price is going to be let's say 60 dollars but mm -hmm. you have people who have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars. Star Citizen made half a billion, over half a billion on crowd crowdfunding. Mm. Um, I'll tell you, both me and Maso um, have, through different ways, doesn't really matter, but have 
paid multiple multiple copies potentially of this game yeah. to support the project rather than so literally if you are if you buy one copy you know because they have an open policy where you can you can invest as much as you want in return you get something that they call store credit and for this store credit you can you can buy assets in game so, so say mm -hmm. ships for example that you can play in the current beta which unfortunately majority of player base because we're we're not a game yet right the majority mm -hmm. of player base sees as buying ships for cash to get to play the game now with the with a certain ship which by the yeah. way you can buy in game as well if you like play the game but you know um so so if you are buying only the minimum amount which is like $45 which gives you one little ship and and access to to the current uh, state of the game i agree yeah. with you if they limited if if you couldn't spend more than what let's say somewhere around the price of the game a little bit more a little bit less whatever it is right then i would agree with you because then i'm just buying the game up front but i feel like um <laughs> well i think there's a couple different things that are different different but uh, yeah. different in okay. this situation but but finish finish your thought well there. i just just kind of feel like a lot of people have it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous way of of developing the game in my mind because we all feel like we all have some expectations from this game right mm -hmm. and we all want our expectations to to materialize in the game um <laughs> where that's obviously impossible personally i i don't have this i am well aware that yeah even, no matter how much i invested i'm okay with me not liking the game and not playing it it's fine um you know i want them to pursue their own ideas and then i want to like it but if i don't it's not the end of the world you know it, it yeah. is what it is but but i do believe that i'm not a majority of player base <laughs> Or, no, there or at are least a, lot a loud people, majority. <laughs> there are a lot of people who feel uh, extra entitled to those uh, to those viewpoints because they have put more than just your standard exactly. amount into the game. They feel like they're kind of entitled to, uh, like their opinions have more weight because they've you know they've proportionally put more into this project than you know than your average gamer would. Um, more so, what I was where I was going to. Uh, where I was going to try to kind of like kind of take this is that uh, the, I think one of the main differences between this and a conventional model is that they don't have the same pressure to hit deadlines as most traditional games do, because, mm -hmm. you know, if the marketing team can keep the revenue coming in, they can expand the scope and, and have, have room to, to really experiment with, with ideas um you know more than a mm -hmm. traditional kind of uh kind of game uh studio would and i think that's that's the positive side of the, yeah that's of that's a that's a wonderful luxury like i've yes most of the games i've worked on had a had a ship date before we before we started um and there's definitely some games out there that keep rebooting until they get it right yeah behind closed doors i mean dragon age 4 is in that list um uh, the new game from the the creator of the Bioshock series is in that mm -hmm. list. He's been toiling away for almost a decade now on something, um, and he has pretty much carte blanche. And even um, when I got to when I got to uh, Bioware, uh, the first Dragon Age game had been going for what, seven years. Um, some people had shipped three games in the time that um, that other friends of theirs hadn't shipped a single thing. Um, so it. it it's an amazing luxury to be able to iterate yeah. until you feel something is right. Do you think um, that's but, a, like a double-edged sword sometimes? But, yes. Oh, yeah. absolutely a double-edged yeah. sword because this technology Age, is evolving and Dragon, whatever you're Dragon making. Age, you know? Dragon Age uh, um, cut cut everything, basically, basically threw everything out and started over again with a new engine at one point because things just got it, too old. Stars didn't um, do that. <laughs> did they? they of course. That? Yeah. Well, they started with with CryEngine um, and then switched to a uh, uh, offshoot of CryEngine owned by Amazon Lumberyard, um, right? Midway through the project because you know they weren't getting the support they mm -hmm. needed through CryEngine and they needed to do massive kind of changes to code. Yeah, uh, a lot of the a bunch of reasons. A but... lot of the challenges um, that led to Mass Effect Four, Mass Effect Andromeda, not not hitting quite the quality that. Um, that the other games had were similar so they they had a lot of high ambitions and 
and they realized they needed to do some really big revamps of tools and technology to get there. The challenge was they didn't have, they weren't given the time and resources for that, and they had to, to they had to ship things out in quite a hurry. After they realized, wait a minute, we we would love to reboot some of this tech uh, to bring it to a next generation. Yeah. Now, one of the other sides of this double-edged sword, I think, and this is something that I think is pretty unique to to Star Citizen, um, going kind of tying back into that the the conversation about, um, you know, how much sway does marketing have, uh, in in the development of of the game is as we're starting to hit a point in in Star Citizen where it's starting to we're starting to feel, or it seems like anyways, we're starting to feel the marketing team kind of holding the reins yeah it it, it, there are situations we've come in in the past year where it feels like like the marketing's drive for funding has superseded uh uh particular uh emphasis on on game mechanics or pushed some things forward over over others and things like that and uh you know like that like it's tough to say because we're just armchair devving here, right? Like mm-hmm. we, we well, we're not actually are, in these conversations, but <laughs> uh, you know, but but I I do think that that is something that uh, the reason that we're curious about how much sway the marketing team had in the you know some of the situations you've been in is that is that uh, you know for us in in Star Citizen, it's it's starting to feel like some of these some of these decisions that we think are not fun are are more driven by the marketing department uh, than than the uh, developers themselves but i, I couldn't possibly say yeah. any what any of that could look like armchair um, on that yeah, team it's... but um but there's something that i've been through many many times in games uh which is called the e3 crunch uh, uh yeah so so for example the last uh uh, the last big AAA game i worked on high ambitions struggled with uh with the with uh, the quality on on ship um we we had a lot um e three was a double edged sword as it usually is um, yeah. in the olden days it's different now the when and how people demo games, especially when games can be live for so long before they're quote done it's so such a different world but um we the the marketing department decided what of the game would probably be the best piece to show. We put all of our resources for like two and a half months into that demo, into that slice of the game. We made that the most polished part of the game at that point. We made some major decisions on, just because of the resources we had, we made some big decisions on what of what features in the game would stay and what features of the game wouldn't um, based on the effort in that demo. And then we ended up taking a lot of things that we succeeded on in that demo and building that out into a, to many more parts of the game. So in a way, the marketing department defined a lot of the shape of that game because of their emphasis on their choices for that demo. Hmm. Did they say the game needs to have these big things in it, these these certain types of big like tentpole action scenes? Not explicitly, but they drove that um, in a huge way based on what they thought they could sell at a big trade show. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was in, an interesting way to see that so sometimes an e3 demo can be an amazing like rallying time to to gather everyone around around one piece of content and bring it to a shippable quality see what we learn from it we learn tons of things that that we hadn't been forced to learn yet because we hadn't brought everything to a shippable quality and that was really good for the team it also it also distracts from a whole bunch of other um, mm. things that we might think we want to focus on and certain features might have fallen by the wayside, um, which could have been could definitely be unfortunate for some people. Um, so something else that happened on this last game, it was right in the uh, kind of in that that period a couple of years ago with EA around when Battlefront Two came out, when loot boxes were the conversation. Right. Yeah. And yeah. our game, our game had loot boxes in it. Um, now. I've spoken to the designers involved in the economy of that stuff. That loot boxes at the time were succeeding for a lot of games in a lot of ways. Um, and the designers were never forced, were never told by, say, the business end or any any departments outside of game design that this is the this is something your game must, must, must have. It was something that in the industry at the time, 
was succeeding. Some players were paying enough money into it that it made a lot of sense. Some players didn't love it. Um, but overall, it wasn't so big that it was causing an issue. And it was a too many people as a viable revenue stream. Designers said, yeah, we believe in this. We think we can make it great. We think we can make it fun. Um, in the end, um, Battlefront 2 came out two weeks before our game did. They got absolutely slaughtered in, in uh, the reviews because yeah. of it. Two weeks later, our game came out. Re there was two types of reviews. One was, this is all right, seven and a half, eight out of 10. Good fun, like it. The other kind of the review was, um, this game has loot boxes in it and everything else is shit. Three out of 10. Hmm. And that yep. was not pressure. That wasn't pressure from from business. It wasn't pressure from marketing. It was something that that the design team was passionate about, passionate about saying, this is part of our industry. This is something that people are doing. We think we can make it valuable hmm. to the players. We think, think we can make it worth something. And... Um, and did they succeed? Really hard to say. Um, maybe they made the best possible version they had in the resources. Um, I know that game, we cut a lot of shit in, um, near the end to make that game ship. Um, and I wasn't involved in any of those decisions. I was just watching it from the wings. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, there was a lot of finger pointing and a lot of blaming at the end um, mm. after that. It, it um, makes sense because um, I was close to a project uh, by a studio here in Serbia that was funded by Wargaming. It's called Pagan Online, and and yeah. they uh, they the, I think they wanted to make a game with loot box system without microtransactions. It's just like a rewarding system with a little bit of RNG. It's like Diablo-like yeah. game, kind of. Yeah. Um, and um, but then when it came out in beta, um, people looked at it and they were like, "This looks like it's gonna have loot boxes." So then they stated immediately to like extinguish this fire. We are never going to to sell loot boxes or anything similar. Mm -hmm. However, this I think this was one of the reasons why it was sacked eventually. I mean, it, it the game was de developed, but unfortunately, yeah. not with a great success. But I think this was one of the reasons. And and now that you talk about this, I can see how, you know, people might look at uh, a drop or a loot box as as just a fun game mechanic, even without a monetary uh, side of it completely. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you it's... something about. I'll tell you something that the game that uh, that last game that I did. It made its money back. It was a financial success. It did well, um, and those. It was a quiet success. It wasn't an amazing giant smash, um, but it hit all of its targets. And those uh, MTX microtransaction features were a big part of that, and gave no no big impetus for the company to to slow down on those kinds of features. Um, they, I believe they have for other reasons, but for all the hand wringing, people were yeah, paying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See that. Okay. Uh, just, go for it. Go uh, for it. I, I'm going to use this an op uh, as an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to transition a game because one of the talking yeah. points that we had down here was about uh, selling in-game assets to fund a project. Yeah. Um, and in this case, before launch, in the case of Star Citizen and, uh, you know, like, like do does that end up inevitably with a scenario where you you kind of design the game around that sort of a that sort of funding model and i i know in this case it did you know obviously it's a different situation than like microtransaction loot boxes and stuff like that because star citizen in most cases is macro transactions but um well it it's it you know, it has no rng as well like you pay what you see basically so i want this ship it's worth this many tokens, whatever, which is worth this much money. So I'm going to go and buy a certain ship, right? That Like, you get what you're buying, right? Yeah. Um, now, yeah, like, it, it, do, you, do you think, like, from your perspective, in the situation where they're selling kind of, uh, you know, in-game assets to fund, like, are is it inevitable that 
that they will end up kind of designing the game around that particular kind of funding model? Or like, is it possible that they still, you know, for the most part are being driven by, by, you know, game designers who want to make a good game? Like, is it inevitable that they become quote unquote corrupted I, to use a, uh... so, so I've, I've never worked on a game where that was part of the core. Yeah. The, I don't the know. Core design set. So I can't speak directly to that, but, yeah. um, I mean, you've you've tossed out a few a few terms and thoughts out there saying that a game where you do buy these things is the antithesis of a good game design, mm -hmm. um, which is which I don't Just, know if, I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, no. To clarify, like I'm not I I I'm relatively neutral on the subject, but I think there are some people who who kind of would kind of take it as more of like a you know like a like demonization versus hmm. uh you know i can i can uh, explain it a little bit from yeah. that perspective just just I, briefly sure. where i think i personally think of so this game uh so star citizen has hundreds of ships and then it has like professions mm -hmm. but it doesn't have a leveling system so basically you are whatever you want to be your skill is it is your own skill of you know tackling whatever the problem is with with the right tool no no levels, no, you know, no, you know, no tech trees or whatever. And I see uh, ships being basically the main progression for me personally in a game because each ship is tied to a certain amount of in-game currency. And if you start with a small ship that basically doesn't do much, then you 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 opt into like certain tech tree of ships. Let's say you want to be an explorer, and there's a ship called Carrick that is your end goal, for example. However, the problem with this is. You can buy that character for, I don't know, like 600 euros or dollars, I don't even know, uh, right now. And when the game is launched, you will have this ship already. So so do you think they, do, 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 would the devs um, or whoever is in charge of, of this progression uh, kind of uh, uh, develop stuff around this thing? Or I mean I don't know what's what's your take on it I guess I don't, yeah. I don't know. So so I'm I'm imagining how how do I create an economy system that supports that supports the idea that anyone could have a ship of any level at any time mm. and have it be consistently a fun experience. So mm. I think back to I think back to uh, I've worked on a bunch of Need for Speed games and two things happen in that game in regards to how people connect with their vehicle because it's um it's it's a series about car culture it's a series about we your, bought, your cars yeah, your, yeah. your car is your car character yeah. so so there's so on one hand people develop a, an emotional attachment to the car that they build throughout the game they they buy it they might build it up they paint it in a certain way that is their car that is their expression of their personality in the world and the history of what they put into that car is and like the hours and hours and hours spent driving it the memories they have with it is a really important important part of mm. the value of that car in the game the other side of it is there's people who say hey i i love bmws all i want in this game is to have the best bmw and that's my expression in this game. And actually, no, um, crap idea. Let's say I want, I love my my crappy little Honda, and I want to be able to turn it into the best possible car in the game and have that have that be my indelible memory of this experience. So one of the challenges in this in making that game series is how do we how do we let people how do we have an end game where people can have the crappiest car be that memory that they carry throughout the entire game, compete against like the top, top, top cars in the world? Or do we have a game where at the very end of the game, everyone's kind of in the same three really high-end cars? Is that the experience and the memory we want to make? Do we want to be realistic mm. and like totally, totally realistic to the physics of this world? Or do we want to be, or do we want to tell a story that people can uh, connect with? So, um, when I think about a game like Star Citizen, um, part of it's where do we create value in the connection with players and their ships? So do we create value based on how we, like, I don't know anything about, you said there there aren't necessarily upgrade trees, you just buy into things. Wow, um, yeah. Do there, we there, connect? Like you, do, can, you can tweak your ship. Can, yeah, okay. like you can tweak so, your ship. But do, are we, you can also like, lose yeah. it, are though, we, by the way. Yeah, are so, we, yeah, are we, is it a game where you, 
you want to be able to level something up and have it with you for your entire career and you have your memory of all those of like you know you have the the stock millennium falcon and you turn it into the best fastest ship in the galaxy or or do you want to just buy something outright how do how do we balance for all those different experiences how um so yeah if there's if somebody's going to buy buy a game for 6 or buy a ship for 600 euro that has to fit in the same economic world as far as experience as somebody who isn't paying that kind of money or can't afford to pay that kind of money so yeah, yeah it it has to it has to affect the game design the economy design mm. the progression design there's no way it couldn't um and designing a game that allows for that business model is is a choice and that has to affect every aspect of of the production. So if this is a game that could never exist without this business model and the business model includes being able to buy a 600 euro ship, um, it's hard to say has has that choice affected the game design because game design wouldn't exist without that choice yeah. in, a, in, a, in a random way. It's just the nature of it. Um, That's simultaneously a, a terrifying thought and also kind of an encouraging mm. thought at the same time to me. <laughs> and every 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 game is kind of an expression of what's available. You know what the problem here of, is of an expression of what uh, what players will will pay if if they started this whole thing and nobody was buying those ships. Yeah, they would have changed their minds. But enough people bought them. They said, "No, we're going to do this. We're going to invest." Oh, people in it. are buying the dice, and people <laughs> yeah, they rolled. The people are buying it. So of course to support it. If nobody bought it, they would have done something different. Yeah, but people yeah. are buying the ships, but we don't have the game yet. So we don't know if that's going to affect the game or not here's the thing though yeah i was it, listening it, to it, a streamer it, will affect, it absolutely will affect the game it can't yeah. not affect the game well, exactly. that's that's where the terrifying part yeah. of my and how uh, will it affect my previous statement go yeah i feel like they're kicking the ball down the down the road and you know and and ultimately they're gonna have to deal with it eventually but it's a hard design <laughs> problem and i'd imagine they're not dealing with it and they don't yeah well there must be but it. how it's... I think they, they, if I was a designer on the team, I would be, okay, I have to accept that different people will have different experiences depending on their level of investment. It doesn't mean certain people will have more fun. Um, I mean, or it shouldn't. Will, <laughs> certain people, if they do it well, they shouldn't. Maybe they here's won't a, do it well. Here's the um, thing. But, so, but the, the, I'll say one last thing on mm -hmm. it is that, um, is that different, they have to know that different people find different value or different fun in the game depending on how they play and they have to know they have the challenge of accommodating so many different ways that people find value in the game experience okay oh that makes sense that, so i was listening to a guy today who was um um playing and streaming new world and um and they're again this amazon game it's a full it's also it's like a full on like pvp kind of well most of it is pvp game and and they were talking about the other game that amazon is bringing which is lost ark and they're talking about microtransactions there and all that and the guy just says straight up of course you're going to have microtransactions of course you're going to be paid to win for pv but i don't care it's pv as long as in pvp we are all on equal terms so when i'm fighting another player he cannot buy into defeating me the problem with star citizen is it's an open world game your ship is your main tool and you know if if it takes if if your ship can just delete my ship and you can just buy day one what you know while i need like seven months to get to that ship through the game experience we might have a problem there because of it's a full loot game you you destroy my ship i've lost it i don't have it anymore i have to like <laughs> get it again and you know start my process of earning again or whatever but that might, sounds like yeah. a big that's a big design problem but if I, any game any movie any media that i consume i have to sit back and say i hope this is good and <laughs> you guys kind of have to do the same thing yeah. you just kind of have to surrender the only difference here is you have a lot more insight in how this sausage is made than most people do for most games yeah. so i have a question for you guys why do you want spoilers for a game that's not out yet what's what makes you what makes you invest so much of your time 
into a game that's not complete? Why do you enjoy it? Why do you, why do you, why are you part of their marketing department creating podcasts? Uh, um, See, the funny thing is, is we ask ourselves this question pretty (laughs) frequently sometimes, you know, because especially lately, like there's been, uh, you know, I, I think, I think it's pretty safe to say that like both Jag and I are feeling, you know, quite a bit of burnout, but yeah. But as far as like uh, as far as to to address the spoiler question, well, because it's a multiplayer kind of like sandbox game, I don't really feel like like I don't really feel like following the development has spoiled. Or, like, it's has it's a different. Spoiler. It's something different than yeah. a. It's not like a movie plot spoiler. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's a different thing. I just before yeah, this, a... I played Eve Online, mm-hmm. and when I checked my character, uh, my 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 first day of playing was in two thousand eleven, so. Mm-hmm. I know all about it. I still play it and enjoy it. Doesn't matter. It's different. And then there's another thing. Like it's a lot of fun most of the times to talk about Star Citizen. Yeah. And usually more mm. fun than to actually play it. So Especially here's right some now. <laughs> here's something that uh, that I've come to really really see in like Hollywood blockbuster um, movies and their marketing and the conversations about the marketing. The most exciting part of a Marvel movie is the time between so after the 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 end credit teaser scene at the end of a movie until you watch the next movie like those two years or six months or whatever between those two movies is the most exciting time anything is possible yeah and all you want to do is talk about it once you actually see the once you see the movie itself it's it's a whole different experience Mm -hmm. the magic is over there's no more possibilities just what's in front of you and see, I think like you, that's that's the answer right there to your question is why are so many people and us included kind of ha- why have we been so interested in uh, following the development, seeing what's going on, etc. And it's because especially in the earlier phases, I've followed this game for for much longer than Chegg has. But but even when Chegg kind of just joined, most of the game was still in that like on paper sounds amazing gives mm-hmm. you lots of room to to kind of like like you said speculate and and think about all the ways that the next or that the game is going to be to be fun and and this is another thing that's going to be and we've talked about it in a couple of our episodes as well like as the game is actually starting to materialize not only us but especially a lot of people who who have played and invested in this game I think are possibly in for some very rude awakenings when 100%. the game that materializes is not what they've what, been yeah. fantasizing. What about. they created the game, in their head, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because you you can never you can never match the fantasy in your head. It might be yeah. an amazing game, but the game in your head always had boundless possibilities. Yeah, and no one game can ever be that. And, so and the ones like who I'm you're liking, about, right? So yeah, if someone I, tells you, let's say. Uh, you know the marketing department tells you we're going to have massive ship fights and that's it so in my head it's going to be like two huge ships fighting each other in masses maybe it's going to be like 100 versus 100 small ships yeah. fight whatever you know like yeah, they, yeah. they make it so that it touches everyone's imagination but you don't really know what it's going to be right in the end I yeah, just and usually marketing it. usually marketing departments um are are not selling ideas and dreams, but selling at least something based on content and context from the from the, the product sure. itself. I mean, yeah. movies, yeah. Us- not always, but almost always, they usually sell trailers with footage from movies, from the movie itself. Mm-hmm. Um, they might be able to manipulate it so it has a certain story or tone mm-hmm. or setting mm-hmm. expectations. Like, we've all seen a great trailer that turns into a shit movie. <laughs> um, but games are a rare... Uh, like a rare product where often the the trailer is created entirely separately from the content of the game. Yeah. You want like something cinematic that evokes the feeling of the game, but the game itself doesn't actually have that content in it. Yeah. Um, mostly because games are exciting to experience, not necessarily to watch. Um, that's hey, obviously excuse changed me? in the last while for streamers. I've been living um, off of people watching me play games for the last yeah. four years. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> but they're, 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 oh, yeah, it's a, it's very different I'm, than it was I'm a decade kidding. ago. I know, yeah, yeah. But but you are part of you are part of the show too. You playing your experience playing is part of the it's part of that entertainment. Um, oh, for sure, yeah. And so yeah, so so yeah, this game Star Citizen is sold based on the dream that it can put in your head. 
yeah which is a fascinating experience because it is obviously working really 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 well for them i wonder sure. how many other games have tried this and have, have well more and it. more I mean, are trying based yeah. on their success mm -hmm. yeah yeah, so, so I can talk about my experience, my emotional experience making games, because you are now going on this whole journey of, of what it's like for a game developer to go on making a game. So I, cause I, I'm, I might be a small cog in a large machine making a game. I'm the creative director sells us on the vision. Oh my God, this is amazing. Look at all this concept art, these game design ideas. This is, this could be so great. And I'm seeing this idea of what the game is like in my head. And then we start putting together the game. Um, I'm working on my areas, my features. I'm watching other people put their parts together. And it's all starting to come together. And we see all these little bits and pieces of features. Um, but it's not a game. It's a bunch of broken things that we can see some possibilities in. Yeah. And then it starts coming together. Like these things start to kind of take a shape like oh i can see how this will fit i can see how that'll fit maybe we'll maybe an area won't work um for example yeah. there's a game year uh, 2006 i was working on a game where the entire theme of the game um was about this like cooperative cooperative um uh, this cooperative feature and they kept prototyping it and prototyping it it never worked it was no fun whatsoever we just couldn't get it to work and we were running out of time okay gotta cut that and found a whole new anchor for the game. Um, and uh, so sometimes you'll hit a point where like, okay, this is coming together, but holy crap, this is a mess. Nothing works. The game's always breaking. Um, all these awesome ideas aren't materializing. It's all the broken versions of the stuff um, the, that I hoped for. This favorite feature of mine, we have to cut. Um, I this game, This area used to look amazing, but now we've had to like, um, get rid of half the resolution because it's making the frame rate too slow. So suddenly the whole, so when you're like two thirds of the way through the game, everything looks like a compromise from what the vision was. And you start having this horrible feeling of this it's will never very work. Emotional. This is, this is going to be, mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard. It's so emotional because mm -hmm. you've spent all this time. I know this feeling. Putting it into it yeah. and then, and then putting yourself into it, um, rallying around everyone else, putting their work into it. And then in the last third, most of the time it really starts coming back together and the polish comes in and you you on every game i've been on you have a day where you're like holy shit that was awesome mm. this looks like a game and it all starts coming together um sometimes it's, it comes it's such a together, complex process it's insane yeah sometimes it comes together beautifully sometimes it's a version of a compromise and you say holy crap we came through that fire it's not what we hoped but i'm so proud that we got something shippable like every every game that I've finished that wasn't great, that didn't review great, um, I can track back and look at the reasons why, but they are but I'm always proud of how we came through despite the uh despite all the struggles See, and challenges. I, um and then at the end, you you have to kind of sit back and think, you know what, this isn't exactly what I thought it would be, but I'm proud of this. I might be disappointed in that, but you start to accept what's actually in front of you and that period of letting go of the dreams and loving or at least accepting the reality of what's in front of you is a hard transition and i feel like star citizen might be going through that phase right for now. sure well or, or and it might go for for a long time at least for the yeah. backers <laughs> here's the thing yeah. first of all i understand 100 percent what you're saying because just like you as i said i've, I've worked on on many many and with big names and, and some big projects here, you, I'm sure yeah. you, you understand, like, you know, cheap workforce in some countries and yeah. whatnot. So, uh, oh, yeah. so yeah. And, and it's some, in some movies I would work as a, as a prop uh, artist and mm -hmm. under uh, scenography de uh, department. And then we would spend like seven days creating this and we were like, Oh man, <laughs> it's so good. And then, and then whoever is in charge of your department comes there, checks it out. Amazing. Like they, they love it. And then, mm -hmm. and it doesn't end in a cut at all. Like you just, you watch that scene and you're like, what? Wait, we've <laughs> spent seven days. Yeah. It's just not there. Like the only, yeah. the only thing I have is a picture on my phone and it is just heartbreaking. But, but in the end, yeah. there's a big picture of a complete project, right? Like you were not working on one thing only or whatever. And in the end you get that, you get that awesome feeling of accomplishing something as a group and you know 
and then it gets in front of the fresh set of eyes, right? So it's your own project or your team. And here I agree with you, I understand. However, the problem with Star Citizen is exactly that, because I am paying for them to make their their project. And mm -hmm. and I am watching them make it. And these little mistakes, and by the way, playing devil's advocate here, but seeing them make these mistakes, it feels like they're making mistakes with my money. And sometimes, you know, it's it's brutal. I can I can only imagine because mm -hmm. These devs, they also listen to to bunch of uh, of content. We see very like devs from very different uh, branches in different streams, YouTube videos, and whatnot. They appear, they they see, they they hear. Um, but but, and sometimes yeah. we can we can be brutal for sure. Like, and I can't understand. Like sometimes I'm like, how can a guy say? I hate PvP, and then he is in charge of creating a PvP event in the game that is that is really bad, like the the completely bad event that did not work out in the game at all, and then he is in charge of another PvP event. Or how could you think that this will work when when ten other games tried and failed, and now you're trying again? The difference is it's not the studio's money that it, well it is technically, <laughs> you know what I mean. What I'm yeah, trying to say is like. Them. What what is uh th there's that that uh, kind of screwed up um, perspective of mm. expectations from so many people that are investing in your idea. It's, it's a really challenging situation because it it gets the core of what what relationship do you have with a studio? What do they owe you? What do you owe them? Nothing. Um. What what's what's the terms of what what are the terms of the agreement? Um, Nothing. They here. could just stop you, today yeah. and you know scratch it. Yeah. And there's an emotional that's, connection. That's the problem. Yeah, and that emotional connection is what's kept the money flowing in. It's what's kept yep. this yeah. engagement going for yeah. a long, long time. It was really marketing. And oh. Uh, okay. oh, I think we lost yeah. you there for a second. Yeah, your 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 upload is struggling a bit again. Oh, if yeah? you think it would be better if you want to like, if you want to like turn off camera and like so that we can have you, we can have your your uh, sure, voice we can better. That. Yeah, where where are you guys? Because I really I like your your takes, man. This is this is turning yeah, into I a great experience. Really, I'm wanna... turning off camera now. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, I, can you still things... hear me? Yes, yes, we can yes. still hear you. So, I, that's actually yeah, so that... um, oh, sorry, continue. I'll just, yeah, so I'm not sure if you caught everything I said. Yeah, so it's it's absolutely brilliant marketing um, on their part because they have an emotional engagement with an audience before a game is even out compared to like the Marvel series, the Marvel movie series, the years of slow building to get that engagement mm -hmm. um, going. But yeah, what what everything you're saying about yeah, why are they screwing this with my goddamn money? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. They're not, I don't screw up anything more or less than any other game developer is as they're trying to figure out what they're doing and what will work and what won't. I mean, um, except you get to see it and you have an emotional relationship to it than on most games. Um, and like, why are they, the question that come up, and why are they doing something that sounds like it shouldn't work? If you tell me you can only do what's been done before successfully, safely, I'm not that interested in doing it. Why don't I want to try to do something new? Why don't I want to try to do something that um, that has never succeeded before that I, maybe I can make work or be on, on the very edge of, of creativity? Um, it's a really hard place to be. And usually, not always, but often those failures have shadows here those failures are happening in the light i can't i can't speak to instance of somebody who who is failing at pp events and yeah. either not the right for leading it i have no idea i don't know what's going on there um but hearing that somebody hasn't succeeded at something in the past isn't always a reason for me to not want to try it it might be a challenge for me to say no i can do this I can yeah, actually I can uh, get this I can figure this yeah, one out. Yeah, that's a good take. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good take too because like when I really think about it, I think one of the reasons a lot of people are so interested in Star Citizen is that is that they've specifically said 
that they don't want to do things that have done that that have been done before. They want to try to do something new and and really push the envelope and go into some risky territories that I don't think uh, uh, that I don't think uh, a traditional kind of uh, game publisher would would have let them do. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. nor nor would they have been able to just from a simple like uh, from a simple uh, like a deadline perspective. I mean, they're going on. They announced their Kickstarter in 2012 is when they came with basically, um, you know, their their first pitch. So they're going on 10 years from from inception at this point. I won't say from development because mm-hmm, they mm-hmm. didn't have a studio at that point. But, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, I, I, it, I think it would have been. And you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think another traditional kind of publisher would have would have, you know, been on board with a a game of this scope where the development time is potentially fifteen, you know, yeah. who knows, twenty. Not, years. No, not no, a, no, not two years. This, excuse not at that me. burn. Yeah, not at that burn rate for sure. I mean, you have you have Ken Levine uh, with his new studio, like the guy who did Bioshock. Um, he's coming on. I don't know is he coming on 10 years but, um, but is it open development team. or no they're they're totally closed development well that's yeah that's team. that's exactly then, what it is you right? also you also have the new dragon age a uh, dragon age 4 which is what coming on six, six yeah seven years now yeah. something like that with ten year development a bit of times. cash just true um, yeah cyberpunk so, was a 10 year uh 10 year so project it's, as far as i understand it's, it's not common but it absolutely happened Oh yeah, um, and especially if you're doing something that no one else does. To be honest, if I think if they said it, okay, I have two like, I have two like quick kind of questions to throw at you, and one yeah. is completely on this topic. It's uh, a yeah. when when Star Citizen like in 2012 when they created a project, and a lot has changed from them because they made a lot of money, right? But back mm-hmm. then and since then, there's a there's a running meme that says the game will be released in two years, basically, and it's been ten years. So my first question mm-hmm. to you is: Is do you th- do you know if studios do this on purpose or not, where they give you fake date of release mm-hmm. and uh, knowingly? Because I I am hundred percent sure that once they change the game to where we're going to land on each planet, then the the scope and size of it, and and you know. Uh, all the new tech that they have to develop. But then they said again, two years, <laughs> the game is out. And they keep saying mm-hmm. that. Well, anyone and their grandma knows that there's no way this game is coming out in two years. Like it's 100% obvious. So my question to you is, do you do they do, they do this on purpose knowingly or, or are they delusional? So I, I have never, I have never once heard of any, anyone, um, anyone sharing fake information like that okay once. never heard of of any any studio publisher developer uh marketing department lying um and in fact on publicly traded companies um it it's illegal to to cre- uh to disseminate data that's false um because it can it can uh, in that sense because it can artificially inflate um stock values um so it, it's, well, that's exactly it what's happening tantam- here it would be a tantamount to like some sort of like not insider trading necessarily but insider manipulation mm-hmm. of of stock kind of things um on publicly traded companies which I yeah but this is exactly here. what i've been saying um, from the beginning but, but they are yeah, so, they are funding them so, so it's kind so of different so your your not second public, yeah, uh, exactly. yeah, yeah your second your 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 addendum to that question was or are they delusional yeah they are okay <laughs> no, I'll take that. No, that's fair. That's they, fair. They, if, they, yeah. they think they're, they're, from where they're sitting, they think, no, we can get this done. Okay. We can, you know, sure, we can get this done. And then, you know, a couple months down the road, they say, you know what? This isn't going as fast as we thought. We thought we could wrap this up. Oh, we have this new idea. Oh, the money is still flowing in. Why? So I think we can afford to invest a bit more in here. Let's take a little bit more time. Absolutely. They See, can, that, that's they, one of those. They where... could come They could come to the belief that they could have a finished game in, in that time. The question is, mm-hmm. what's that game look like? Is that the game they want? Um, do they make the choice to? Um, Eventually, I've they been... actually told us that money does not equal faster development anymore. Like, obviously, no. you know, it's going up exponentially and then it hits the wall. There's mm-hmm. diminishing returns where you just... Yeah, it's, it's that it's that same old same old chestnut about yeah. you can't you can't yeah. have nine women make one baby in a month. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
<laughs> okay, the second thing, and this is a huge one for me, uh, is when Star Citizen was starting, they actually were selling a game that is called Squad of 42. If I'm not wrong, Maso, yeah. you can correct me. And and yeah. that was the original pitch and, and people were pledging for this. It's a single player game. Well, okay. The original pitch was actually, if I'm not mistaken, for Squadron 42 and Star Citizen, but okay. the the online version and uh you anybody who's listening to this on youtube can correct me if i'm wrong in the comments but um i believe that they were they it was still the idea was to have a multiplayer component to squadron 42 as well i don't think it was pitched originally as just a single player but okay. but again like the the multiplayer version the mmo version was drastically scaled down um I, again like that almost as an option ago, kind of but, right but yeah, so the, the single player uh, <clears throat> title, Squadron 42, instead of just being the campaign for Star Citizen, is actually releasing as a separate title, or at least that's that's been the plan. And, and for, part of Trilogy for like now, forever. and God yeah. knows if it's going to have more sequels. So, so basically what happens is three, four years ago when I joined the whole shebang, I wanted to invest into an MMO in space, a MMO player. In general, I love space games, um, and that's what I went for. When I when I pledged for this whole thing with my first forty five dollars, I never ever saw or knew that there's a single player game uh, happening at the same time. So to just like quickly like explain what's happening here is eventually while doing these podcasts and streaming and, you know, get being more and more interested in the project and whatnot, I've learned, and a lot of people did as well, but some probably don't know still, is that funding of Star Citizen is actually going mainly into a single player game called Squadron 42, which will have at least two more sequels. Um, and some assets for for the multiplayer universe that we are we are playing in are being held because of the potential spoilers and you know what not mm -hmm. um and and this is something that now we are kind of aware of at least we who are making the the content and what not and um uh, there's a whole issue between like people who don't care about MMO the other people who don't care about a single player experience what not there's a whole you know jumbled up crazy experience happening there however squadron 42 which is a huge project with with some you know hollywood you know actors voice acting um and and you know amazing music and like the whole uh triple a uh yeah. kind of like sort of triple a uh, scale experience that we're going to get from that it's slowly getting to a point where even i believe it might be either in beta or, or released in next two years let's say maybe when yeah. maybe in a year i don't know um my question to you is because star citizen right now which is a, an mmo uh part of it is yeah. playable for many years now and it's their yeah. test bed basically so everything that goes wrong a bunch of us play they figure it out they can change it fix it and then all these assets are being used in in squadron 42 I came up to a conclusion that there's a possibility, and and I hope I'm wrong, but I wonder if this is even, are we crazy, am I even crazy to think about this? And please don't crucify me uh, in the comments, guys, it's just uh, something that crossed my, my mind. Do you think it's possible that once they, uh, they release Squadron 42... Which will it? I expect that to have success on scale as like Cyberpunk or something like that. It, it's very yeah. highly expected game because it comes from Chris Roberts and you know there's yeah. a history behind it and um and that's a money maker, right? Like you you release you make hype, you release a game, you make money on day one of sales or whatever. Um, do you think that then because the sequels of this game will be using somewhat similar assets? You know you have to build up to the sequel story voice voice acting whatever but you're using the same stuff do you think they might sack the they might sack the the mmo because mmo genre is kind of not in yeah. the best spot and and i don't think any studio is delusional that much that they think they're gonna make m like some crazy amounts of money because no no mmos are succeeding yeah. not even not, not anymore even, yeah you, you yeah. know i i feel like the traditional mmo genre 
you know, has kind of like had its heyday so, and peaked with World of Warcraft, and then. So I, I think I, I think I, I understand the question here. Is 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 the Squadron Forty Two game going to come out, and and everything that you've invested in and emotionally that you've loved about about um, Star Citizen will yeah, that all MMO be scrapped? Part. Will that yeah. all be scrapped because this other this other thing ends up being the better business business um, option? Kind of. I yeah. couldn't possibly. I couldn't possibly say. I have no idea. Okay. I have no insight on that whatsoever. Um, I have no, yeah, no idea. Yeah, that that is very we... fair. I think that's our answer for ourselves as well, It which kind of is painful in a way because both of us want an MMO experience, but, but just but the fact like... that we can't say no, there's no way this is going to happen. Yeah. I, I, I think... mean, Squadron 42 might get, might get cancelled. Um, no, like you, yeah, you yeah. look at you, you never nothing's real until it's real. You look that, at the number of yeah, Star I agree Wars with that. movies that have been there announced over the last yeah. three years, and none of them are in production. And now yeah. we have these TV shows that we didn't expect, and there's more and more of them because they are excellent. So and they're saying, mm -hmm. yeah. "Hey, these Star Wars TV shows are great. Let's make more." We're sure. not, are we ever going to get that um, that Rogue Squadron um, movie that they promised last year? Maybe, maybe not. But but we might get real Rogue till, Squadron it's series. Not real. It's not real till it's real. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, so that, we never got the Boba Fett movie, but now we have a we have two yeah, Boba Fett TV, TV shows. Show. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's I think like where where I would kind of like where I would kind of go with that line of thinking is like I think I think obviously it's possible that they could because you know again I mean I think they've been pretty clear that this whole thing is experimental. Um, but I guess that would, the, the main man. question is like let, if they let me tell I'll just say one more thing before sure. before I got to get going here is. I've seen so many games get cut, get cancelled, um, never shipped. Could Star Citizen be any different? I don't... Why Why wouldn't it be different? The only difference is you guys get to watch it happen and get to be yep. there through it. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. No, no, what you said a minute ago, like, it's not It's not over till it's over. Like, basically, yeah. 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 It's we also not real till it's real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So but, I don't know, like, I, I got to say, Ed, like, most of most of these talking points here and hearing your, your responses have, like, had, like, I can see so many ways that a lot of what you're talking about with your experiences could also apply to, to Star Citizen as well. So I, I personally, I think this was a really, really fun conversation to have, and I'm pretty glad that you were willing to uh, waste your valuable time with us. <laughs> But that was, uh, it was a great way to spend a, a lovely, uh, lovely weekend morning. Yeah, <laughs> and, but anyways, or yeah. evening for me. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. I'm super happy that Maso brought this up, and I think there's so much value in the fact that you are unbiased in this whole thing because mm -hmm. you're not, you know, you're not playing it, you're not, uh, you know, you're not invested, you're not working on the project, mm -hmm. or at least not that we know of. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but yeah, thank you so much. It was such a great experience, and I'm I'm super grateful for you showing up, man. It was Appreciate my pleasure. That. Thanks so much for uh, the wonderful conversations. <laughs> and uh, if you're listening to this uh, on YouTube uh, and you liked it, please throw us a like and a subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Our uh, schedule is pretty sporadic right now, <laughs> um, but uh, you know we will we'll try to keep you posted. If you follow me on Twitter, I usually give a give a kind of a heads up if we're going to be doing something. I guess if you have uh, further questions for Ed, I can't promise that he's going to troll the com the the comment <laughs> section like I do, but uh, you I can definitely him. pass him along. <laughs> yes, yeah. and uh, and reply as well. So yeah, uh, and uh, you can find me um, Ed Douglas. I'm on Twitter at Edward J Douglas um, and instagram where i'm mostly sharing pictures of food and movies i like Ooh. um edward j douglas um, do you, do you ever well. sneak in like uh, some pictures from the sets that you're on i've, I used I've to done do a that. bit of that i've done yeah. a bit of that i've also done a couple deep dives on some uh, i recently did a deep dive on one of my favorite mass effect scenes that i made um, amazing and that's up on that's up on twitter as well and i do those every now and then Okay, so Ed is going to give me all the all the you know info, and obviously, as always, it's under it's under the the video, so you can just click and drop a follow, check him out. I yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Ed, before you go, I mean, not that we have a huge audience or anything, but uh, is there something you're working on now that you want to plug or? Um, oh yeah, go for it, man. <laughs> I, 
Hi. Um, so I have a couple short films that are wrapping up the, uh, all sci-fi, wrapping up their festival seasons. Um, nothing. They're not publicly available yet. Um, and yeah, the the new year has a lot of uncertainty of what's going on in it. But people keep telling uh, people keep saying the word NFTs around me, and I don't know how to feel about it. We did not <laughs> touch on that one. We didn't even touch on that. But it's probably that's the, the next. Best. That's the next one. Next yes. Podcast. <laughs> sure. Cool. All right. Thanks well, again, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, Maso. Right. Thanks everyone Thanks, for guys. watching, and uh, we'll see you all next time when we see you. Take care. Have a great one. Bye. Bye.